We're here in Tokyo, Japan, where IA4 is holding its annual conference on arts and humanities, cultural studies, and social sciences. I'm here with Professor Grant Black from Chuo University in Japan. Uh, thank you for being here, Professor. Could you briefly introduce yourself and what you do? Uh, hello, Mina. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be here as well. I'm, uh, yes, I'm a professor of commerce at Chuo University here in Tokyo. I'm also a vice president of IA4 and on the board of directors, and I have my own little consulting company, uh, Black Ink Consulting. You presented a panel discussion this morning. Could you briefly explain to us what it was about and why it is important to talk about this? Well, it has been a very timely topic. It was, was ethics and care in sole custody policy in Japan. Japan uh, is the only country in the G7 that doesn't have a joint custody policy. It was just passed uh, on the 17th of May, just a, a week or so ago, to implement joint custody going forward, but it doesn't start until 2026, so in two years' time. It's a very important issue because uh, it's, it's garnered quite a bit of international attention um, around the issue of child abduction, of children not having access to uh, one of their parents, in Japan, that is usually the case that it's the children are with the mother. In 90% of divorce cases with children in Japan, the mother gets custody. And 70% of those cases, the child never sees the other parent ever again. So it's a very important topic and we're able to bring together a great uh, panel of a sociologist from Soci Sophia University, Professor Davucci. Um, we had uh, the number one child psychologist in Japan, Dr. Odegiri, uh, on the panel, and, um, and also Professor Harada, who's at Nagoya University uh, Graduate School of Law. We also had a longtime um, uh, Japan advisor, uh, uh, Timothy Langley, of Langley Asquire, who a very important voice on uh, policy and government, is government issues uh, here in Japan. Considering the very recent changes, that, the bill that passed last week, um, it is very interesting that policy is changing and usually we see that policy is changing at a um, slower rate than cultural values within society. Yeah. So the fact that we're seeing this change in policy, does that reflect a change in family values within Japanese society? I think it'd be wrong to say that, that things aren't changing and that there aren't developments. But honestly, after engaging with our experts on the panel, I'm, I'm even less optimistic than I was before that it re will represent any real change. I think the first uh, thing to, 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 to gets our immediate attention is the fact that the, it's delayed for another two years. Um, why not implement it and have it come into effect sooner? Um, the reality is as well, the only thing that the, the current uh, law change brings into effect is simply that now there is a mechanism available for joint custody. Before there just wasn't any mechanism. Even if uh, couples were, had an amicable split, still only one of the parents would get custody. And if, if, the, if there was visitation, it, that would just be on the uh, co uh, cooperation and and um, uh, willingness of, of both parties to do so. There was no no legal mechanism for that, and introducing that now does mean that it's possible legally to arrange a joint custody. But the thing that we showed in our panel, from from uh, various angles of our panelists, is that without other supports, other uh, programs implemented, that this really doesn't uh, mean any great change at all in the law because if there's if there isn't a willingness to agree to it which uh, as is the case in 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 all countries that deal with divorce proceedings the number the percentage of divorces that are amicable and and can be arranged simply is 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 is, is limited unless there's a mechanism for dealing with uh, conflict divorces where the court can act in a way as a guide and as a protector of 
protector of um, uh, the care of what is in the best interests of the of the children, protector of the care of um, uh, uh, if if the uh, if there's a, a domestic violence case or something. There's a wide range of of issues there, even even in the even in the in the, in in a, in a case where it's very bad relations between the parents. Um, that shouldn't preclude the possibility of both parents being able to have an active role in the in the life of the child. So, without those kinds of mechanisms to help um, evaluate and measure different parts of the of the of the conflict, um, uh, Professor Odigiri suggested that you know we need, as other countries have, we need to have uh, some evaluation for uh, domestic violence, so it can be. So they can be categorized and evaluated. So that there can be supports in place and help. Uh, we need to have things like uh, co-parenting counseling for how to do it. You know how that's going to happen. That needs to be supervised and 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 uh, uh, guided for the parents to do this. Is not going to happen naturally by itself. So in and of itself, just introducing a the possibility of joint custody ultimately will not have any great impact on what the current situation is. Why is it so hard to reform policy in Japan? Well, Timothy Langley said overall policy change does tend to happen fairly slowly and, 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 and take a long time to move. On this particular issue, um, uh, his point was that there actually isn't really a willingness to, to make any real change. Uh, pressure from the outside, you could almost say this is a. Uh, it, it has the appearance of a token gesture. You know, somebody unfamiliar with with this area uh, could look at it in the newspaper and see, oh, Japan's made this great change. They've introduced joint custody, and it it, it comes out as a very positive, um, uh, you know, news blurb. But the reality, uh, actually underneath of it is that it, it doesn't really represent any great change, not as it appears to. Considering the recent developments that um, we see happening in Japanese demographics, there's um, 880,000 foreigners who currently hold permanent residency in Japan and that number is constantly increasing, which means that more foreigners are settling down and creating transnational families with Japanese nationals. Um, considering this, this advancement, or I would call it an advancement, um, how, how does the law deal with this intercultural element and how do people in society deal with this intercultural element? Well, I, I think in terms of the, the possibility of parental alienation and losing access to your children, I think that uh, very few people enter into uh, that kind of marriage with the Japanese being aware of that or, or knowing that. And even if you, even if someone were to be aware of it, I think you, it's very difficult to imagine that that's going to happen to you. So I think, um, um, uh, re you know, remains the majority of re relationships do seem to last. The, the, the divorce rates are higher uh, in international marriages than they are um, among you know, same country couples. But um, yeah, I think um, recently there's increasing awareness of this and uh, there are a few people who are getting more active raising awareness and the foreign governments have started to get more engaged and involved in these uh, what from from the outside perspective look like child abduction cases domestically are just treated as separation. So is that becoming a global issue because countries are becoming more interconnected that that foreign governments are interfering into the Japanese law? This is just one example of the, the, one of my interests in this is around 
the idea of um, uh, a policy translation. Uh, before, in an, in an earlier book, I looked at education policy translation, and is in, in particular looking at how policy migrates and then mutates as it's being implemented. And I think we have a similar thing here. There's, uh, but now just in in family policy, that there's an influence. Uh, like a, 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 there's a globalizing process. I, I, I get this from uh, Norbert Elias uh, wrote about a civilizing process. I've adopted that as a kind of uh, heuristic, a way of understanding or thinking about this, that our interdependence and interaction for Japan being part of G7, signing on to The Hague, signing on to 35 years ago, the UN rights of the child, None of what we've described as the situation in Japan aligns at all with United Nations rights to the child, of which Japan is, is a signatory. So um, all of those, all of that influence, all of that engagement um, as a kind of globalizing process means that the, there, there are policy ideas that are, that are uh, being translated into this society, but in that translation process, not just as a translation literally of the words into Japanese, but translation into the, the operative functioning of, the, of society and, and its government rules and regulations, the, the way in which, so the thing that we just described is a way in which that migration is being mutated for it to become something slightly, slightly different that doesn't have the same kind of impact and influence on, on the society as a whole that you might imagine it would have. I found the same thing with education policy. Right? Just because policies were adopted didn't mean that they necessarily changed the, 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 um, uh, the prior systems and functions that were in place. Which is intriguing because how can Japan still be a member of all those international organizations when it doesn't adhere to the policy changes and to, to the, to the uh, ideological changes, philosophical changes that should be made? Well, I, I think it, it, it's part of the interesting um, dynamic of Japan being uh, an Asian country with a very uh, ancient history and strongly connected uh, to its roots in Asia and, and you know, great influence from, from China and, and from Korea and other influences in, from the region. You know, very much uh, an Asian identity country, but which is primarily uh, politically and globally oriented to um, uh, uh, other developed countries, like as represented with G7. And that in, in, that, in that sense, uh, it's a very important and interesting partner because it does present uh, uh, different views, different values, different ways of seeing the world. And um, there are many, many areas in which uh, um, the other G7 countries, we could, we could point in the same way of you know, them being a, a part of G7 with Japan and yet not able to do things that Japan does very well. So it's not a one-sided uh, uh, situation or relationship. It's definitely not just that um, you know Japan is on the receiving side of of you know, great wisdom from the other the other things, but there does seem to my my, my sense in, in in academia at least that um, at the, the 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 thinkers at the highest levels of society. Uh, that there is a recognition. I think it's pretty, the evidence is pretty conclusive that, that children who have a father in their life fare better and that, that this, uh, there does seem to be, there's not total agreement. There are people who accept the status quo and, and um, it, you know, it has to be said there is an advantage. One advantage is that if, if there is a uh, complete split, 
that, if, that the, the children are no longer exposed to, to conflict and, and fighting and things, which is also clearly detrimental and not in the best interest of the child. So that's one, that is one positive that you can point to. But yeah, I think that, that um, even though the, the historical and the social, and, and we, uh, we can't go into all of the, the points here, but you know, in the, in the panel we really talked about so many different strands of Japanese society that all align with why this change is so difficult to, to make. But yeah, I do think that um, at, the, at, at the thinking level, uh, people are recognizing that, that, this is the, that this is the direction that we want to move in. It's just going to be a long time before we see real societal changes. And one of, one of those things, an important one, um, Melina, is around the, um, this still being a very uh, uh, gendered society, and it still uh, has uh, one of the highest educated um, female populations, and then the highest level of un underemployment. Um, and the most, the highest percentage of, of women with advanced degrees n not in the workforce of, of any other country, which means that primarily uh, uh, taking care of children is seen as a woman's role and, and, and labor as a man's role. And as, as long as those two things remain, it's difficult to uh, envision balanced joint custody because that's a division of labor that fits with the sole custody or at least the children being given only uh, to the care of only one parent, the mother. It is a very complex issue that you cannot only look at family policies or family patterns. You really have to look at, as you said, issues of gender, then also how the, the labor market is structured, how right. the corporations are offering um, state benefits to families based on the man's occupation, for example. All those right, structures right. are conducive to, to the sole custody tradition that has been going on. Exactly, yeah. mm, in, in regards to that, what are your concerns for the future of families in Japan? To a certain extent, this is um, Obviously, it's not the majority of families. Um, in, in many ways, uh, Japanese society is very successful at raising children. Um, there's education, in terms of education policy, um, primary education in Japan is uh, highly regarded in the world. You know, there's lots of examples of uh, how well the schools are run, the way the children take responsibility, there are no janitors in the school, the children do all the cleaning, um, the, the level of independence that young children have in Japan, of being able to go out and go to the, the store by themselves, be able to travel on the train. It's, it's very common to see young children traveling alone on the, on the train, and th those are things to be um, uh, applauded and, and celebrated as you know, signs of, of, a good, uh, of good positive things in Japanese culture. And lastly, um, why is it important to talk about these um, things that are locally contexted within an international conference? Well, as I spoke to my panelists and prepared them for this, this, uh, for this conference, one of the things that was a common theme in, in their concerns and discussion is um, uh, you know, three of the panelists are Japanese academics. They were, they're not, uh, it's not so common for them to participate in an event uh, like this, or although they both are, they all are uh, um, uh, frequent participants in, in international conferences, but they tend to be specialized by their field. So part of what I had to prepare them for was uh, that our audience, being an international audience, most of them are non-native speakers of English. So we're all 
uh, together in that and 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 you know IFOR is a very welcoming and accepting place for for people who are trying to communicate in another language um, of course we were at an advantage th there and the other thing is that that the our audience would be mostly non-experts in our in our in, in in each respective field whether it's sociology psychology or the legal side most would not be that will not be their their field of expertise and also for many they it would be either their first time in Japan or at least they would uh, they would they're not going to be Japan studies uh, people so we really have an opportunity to um, to educate the audience to bring them in to recognize some complexity about Japanese society and and contemporary issues and um, it just so happened that that you know this this bill went through a week ago, ten days ago, so it was a very it was an ideal, timely topic um, to uh, share with people here in Japan and 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 make them more in, involved and engaged in in contemporary Japanese issues. That's right, and it was a very interesting panel discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank and you. I really enjoyed it. Hopefully, you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank I will. You so thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.